Welcome to this week's Degrees of Science. On October 14, 2024, NASA launched its Europa Clipper mission. It's the first mission designed to conduct detailed studies of Jupiter's moon Europa. There's nine uh, instruments on this, scientific instruments on this ship that is heading towards uh, Jupiter right now. And today we're talking with one of the leaders of one of these instruments. We're talking to Dr. Don Blankenship from the University of Texas Jackson School of Geosciences. So, Dr. Blankenship, I guess before we talk about your exact instrument, what exactly is this Europa Clipper mission and why, why is NASA doing it? Well, Europa, Europa has been in everyone's eyes since the first Voyager missions, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's, it was, Europa is the moon of Jupiter. It's the second moon of Jupiter. It's the smoothest thing in the solar system. And everybody wondered why. And when they got there and took some photos, it was very clear it was ice covered. And the ice was, was substantially cracked. It didn't have many craters, which means that whatever was going on at Europa was dynamic. You think of the Earth's moon, there are craters everywhere. Europa has very few craters, which means that that ice surface is overturning. So the hypothesis was that it was underlain by an ocean. And so if you think about looking for life in the solar system, if you look at Earth, you've got a rocky mantle, you've got an ocean, and every once in a while we're completely, you know, 500 million years ago, we were completely ice covered. And so oddly enough, Europa looks a lot like Earth 500 million years ago. And uh, that's, uh, that's when life got interesting on Earth. So if you're gonna go look for life in the solar system, uh, going to Europa and ice covered ocean world is the obvious thing to do. You're one of the nine instruments and you're the lead investigator for the uh, reason instru instrument. So I love NASA and all the acronyms. So what exactly does reason stand for? <laughs> It's radar for Europa assessment and sounding ocean to near surface. What we do, we, we run a polar geophysics group here as well. So, so I've spent my entire career flying airplanes and helicopters over the uh, Earth's ice sheets. And so we had developed technologies that pretty much didn't exist in the planetary science community. We are able to um, basically explain to the planetary community how to look into the ice on Europa. Uh, the ice on Earth that we sound is like up to two, two, almost three miles thick. And the ice on Europa is hypothesized to be, oh, 10, 10 to 15 miles thick. So you, you originally were working with this in, in, in Antarctica. What, what are you able to see through the ice? Um, and what, what, what does it help y'all to learn about uh, the, the ice shelf down there? It's old enough, we can see everything. It's, it's astonishing. It's, um, uh, if, if you use the right frequency of radar, which hilariously is 60 megahertz, which doesn't mean anything to you, but if you used to work on channel four back in the old days, that was 60 megahertz. So it's the TV broadcast frequency. If you use 60 megahertz and you fly it around Europa, uh, it's the same frequency we use for the polar ice sheets on Earth. And um, we, we can basically see everything if the ice is cold enough. Now, as the ice warms up, then water will start existing. You know, it's, it becomes a little bit slushy. Uh, on the surface of Europa, it's minus several hundred degrees Fahrenheit. But down at the ice ocean interface, you know, 10 miles down, the temperature is exactly the same as it is on Earth. The temperature, the pressure, and we think that the salinity of the ocean on Europa is maybe even a little fresher than Earth. And so essentially what we can see on Earth's poles is what we expect to see for Europa. On Earth, we see layers, but it's kind of weird because you know, when you fly over an ice sheet on Earth, basically it's snowfall every year piling up. So there are layers that represent each year's snowfall. That doesn't happen on Europa. There's no atmosphere. And so essentially what happens is that the snowfall is from the bottom up because the ocean, the ocean circulation will make the water cold and then ice particles will form and then those ice particles are buoyant and so they float up and stick to the bottom of the ice shell. So essentially we're looking at an upside down earth. You know, you're flying into something that you, you don't know everything yet. I know you are doing a lot of modeling to try to, to, to see what may be there. How much is that helping kind of in this waiting time right uh, now? We, yeah, we just wrote a hundred page paper with a hundred co-authors on it describing how that modeling would, would 
you know, imply, you know, would tell us whether this radar would do the job at Europa. We think we're in pretty good shape, but I guarantee you when we get to Europa, uh, something will work vastly better than we ever expected and something will be worse than we ever expected. It's gonna be an interesting three years. Uh, remember, the mission isn't orbiting Europa. The, the mission is flying to Jupiter, going into orbit around Jupiter, and then flying in close to Jupiter and right next to Europa every three weeks. So we have 16 minutes every three weeks that we record, and that goes on, believe it or not, for three years. Um, so it's gonna be a really, really busy time. When we're done, it's very similar to an orbital mission, but the difference is because the radiation around Jupiter is so intense that we fly in and out of that radiation field Instead of setting a mission right into the radiation field, uh, we did a study for that. It would only last 90 days. But if we fly through the radiation belt in just a few minutes, we can last three years. So is uh, Europa like our moon where you're only going to see one side of it or does it rotate? No, yeah, well, it's locked. It is like our moon. In other words, the same side is facing Jupiter all the time. Uh, but we're coming from out. We're coming from Earth, you know. So there's an advantage, and so we spend the first half of the mission is pretty much working on the side of Europa that's away from Jupiter, which is really really nice because we actually we have two frequencies. We don't just we're not just using channel four, but we're using a, one that's about ten times longer than that. The trouble is is that there's a lot of noise from Jupiter at that frequency, so when when we're on the far side of Europa and you are hiding from Jupiter, we can use both of those frequencies and that'll let us see potentially even deeper into the ice shell. And then what we do is we flip over the top and then we send to spend the second half of the mission flying between Jupiter and Europa. So we'll get both sides of the moon. Oh, that's really, really cool. So, you know, now y'all spent over a decade working on this. This spacecraft is launched and on its way, but it's not 1.8 billion miles before it gets to where it needs to and doesn't arrive till April of 2030. So I'm guessing you're not just twiddling your thumbs waiting on it. What goes on now between now and when the well, Clipper mission gets there? Yeah, this year was kind of exciting. We're the biggest, we're the biggest instrument on the mission by far. The solar arrays on the Clipper mission are each the size of a half basketball court. So then our antennas are hooked to the edge of those solar arrays and our, our low frequency antennas are 50 feet long you know, and the high frequency antennas are 10 or 12 feet long. And so there's this, there's six antennas hanging off of those solar arrays. What we had to do, we couldn't launch with those things deployed. So we weren't really fully assembled until after launch. You know, at launch plus 25 days, it was all hands on deck to get those antennas deployed. And we have managed to actually turn the radar on and put power on those antennas. And so that's going great. Uh, the next thing we have to do is um, we're putting a flight plan in right now to go to Mars and we'll be flying, uh, flying by Mars on March 1st. There are two instruments that need to be turned on and it's us and a thermal instrument. And so there really will only be two instruments operating at Mars, but that'll be the first time we can prove that, that we can put power on our antennas bounce off of a planet and see and see that power come back to us. So that'll be Mars in March. Uh, then we're, we have a radio telescope uh, in uh, one of the, next to Death Valley in California. And then we'll be transmitting back to that radio telescope so that we can characterize the beam pattern. That and then uh, what do we do? In the summer, we, we basically image the Milky Way to make sure that, that our radar sees the Milky Way the way we think the Milky Way should be seen. And then sometime at the end of the summer, all of the instruments come on and we discover if anybody is making, um, is making noise at a frequency that matters to us. So it's gonna be a busy year. Man, that, that's a lot of cool stuff. So what do you think, or what are you hoping, I guess, this uh, information that your reason learns about Europa could lead to moving forward with that moon? 
Um, well, the biggest, the most important thing for Europa, because if there's life on Europa, it's not photosynthetic life. It's not going to see the sun. Uh, but the early life on Earth wasn't either, you know. And so it's it's it, they're chemotrophs, you know. They use you know, reductants and oxidants, and they get together and um, provide the energy for life. So the interesting thing is that because Europa's got a rocky mantle, and everybody's seen pictures of those black smokers on the bottom of the ocean, those are those are reduced minerals coming out of there. So those are the reductants. And the weird thing is, is that radiation from Jupiter is basically creating, it's, it's, taking, it's taking water molecules on the surface of Europa, you know, and knocking the hydrogens off. And so that's a perfect oxidant. The biggest question is, how do the oxidants that are all over the surface of Europa get together with the reductants that we think are in the ocean? And that's what our radar does is that we have processes by which we think things at the surface uh, go down to the ocean and other people have hypotheses for how things from the ocean come up to the surface. And uh, we're super sensitive to any water. And so ice is a perfect insulator, but if you warm it up enough, it becomes water, which is essentially a perfect conductor. And so we see those contrasts. So every place that the ice turns into water, we should be able to see. So we should be able to track the exchange between what's going on in the ocean and what's going on at the surface. Well, Dr. Blankenship, uh, I, this is a really cool mission. I wish you all the best of luck and uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, hope we, hope, hope we gave you some idea of how um, crazy it's gonna be in, in five years. <laughs> yes, for sure, thank you. Thank you.